Khadi. Welcome to the mother of all talk shows once again. It's been too long since we last saw you. Uh, bring us uh, up to date, will you, with what's happening across the border from you, where Netanyahu's administration has gotten off to a little bit of a rocky start. Uh, and my thesis that that's precisely why he's at his most dangerous. What do you think about that? Good evening, sir. I totally agree as usual. Actually, one year ago, exactly one year ago, I was here with you on the mother of all talk shows and we were talking about the direct assassination of the Palestinian-American journalist Shirin Abu Aqli, whom later on was proven to be assassinated directly by snipers and by Israeli forces while she was doing her job as a journalist. I was uh, sure to, I made sure to mention this fact as a beginning uh, before I talk, because uh, it seems as if in the Middle East to the global eye and to the viewers and to the news outlets and the mainstream media, it seems as if in the Middle East, some lives matter more than others. Some activists' lives matter more than others. Some whole global propaganda is uh, sometimes in parallel with, uh, with what the world wants to portray or to talk about the regimes in the region. And sometimes some killings are not really uh, in the same sense for the global propaganda and then uh, they are forgotten. I just want to take one moment to contemplate on whether uh, the journalist, the very known proven to be killed in the direct daylight, Shirin Abu Akhle, was Iranian and not Palestinian. Uh, I was wondering what would the international media do? Uh, not to say that one life matters more than the other, but just to portray at this one-eyed world, this great hypocrisy of a media that we all live uh, uh, with. So back to that, sir. Now, as I am in Beirut, what's happening across the borders is not really new to us. But it is more, the audacity is becoming more and more. We have never, uh, uh, maybe even in our best uh, wishes, wished to have such a racist, such a uh, criminal uh, foe in front of us. And this really is good for us, for our cause, for the cause of the people, the native people that have been uh, displaced, that have been killed, that have been... Uh, 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 living through an apartheid system with the Israeli uh, occupation for like decades. What Netanyahu is doing is just he's showing the face of what the actual uh, Zionist ideology wanted to do and is uh, remains uh, undoing. Actually, it is good because it uh, it's once again showing the actual uh, reality of this uh, system of of this brutal uh, racist. Uh, direct apartheid system that is going on in the occupied lands in Palestine. Well, it's good if people are paying attention, Gadi, but if they're not, then the killing and, and uh, colonization continues apace and ever more brazenly and bloodly. I'm so old that when I became involved in this question, first of all, it was labor who were in power in Israel. And they paraded around, believe it or not, in socialist clothes. They were even members of the so-called Socialist International. Since when we have seen a swing all the way to this current Israeli cabinet, where Netanyahu is the most moderate guy in the cabinet, the rest of them are murderous cutthroats and are described as such even by other Israeli politicians and journalists like our good friend Gideon Levy, who is a regular guest on the show. Uh, and yet, you're still not allowed to criticize their action. You're still not al allowed to call it what it is uh, for fear of being banned. For, look, the, Kenneth Roth of Human Rights Watch, an absolute thoroughgoing hypocrite and reactionary, has just been blackballed for a professorship 
at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard because of mild criticism of Israel that he uttered. That's the situation, isn't it? Exactly. Um, I uh, just uh, just now I was uh, checking one of the most uh, productive and uh, useful pages on Twitter, and she was blocked and banned as well. Every day we have something like that. Like that, we're not uh, we're not uh, supposed to document, to factualize, to really say what it is because. Um, even during the wars, when there are these raids, these Israeli raids, whether they are on the besieged uh, Gaza Strip or other places in Palestine, the media are always targeted. The, the journalists are always bullied, killed and assassinated because actually they don't want these facts to come out. Now, as uh, organizations, as personalities, as acad acad academic personalities and media personalities, we're all facing that. And... The funny part is we you are being called or uh, or uh, uh, tagged as anti-Semite when when you are actually a person from this. I am a Semite. How can I be anti-Semite if I'm speaking about an apartheid that is happening? We have a lot of pressure and oppression, and the colonization that is happening. It is with the help of all the world, all the mainstream media, and a lot of the Arab or the actually local or regional uh, entities as well. But the good part. The, the the shining part the, the the full part of the glass the half full part of the glass sir is that the palestinian youth are stronger than ever they are more aware than ever and they are they have been uh, able to prove themselves ever t uh, for the past 2 3 years they have been able to prove themselves as really uh, united and aware and they have been able to prove their causes everywhere inside palestine from actually jenin where the oppression is ongoing day to day, day in, day out. Well, just last week, two Palestinian teen, teens were killed uh, in the in the West Bank. Uh, as we speak right now, women, children, journalists, teenagers, they're being kidnapped, they're being uh, uh, suspended, they're being uh, uh, arrested without even any uh, charge. And uh, this has formed a certain awareness. And the people now are, especially the, the youth, they're more able to use the, the tools and the skills to really shed a light on uh, what their, their lives uh, are like. It is not easy. But when Netanyahu becomes uh, 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 the most uh, moderate uh, figure in the Israeli uh, government or in the uh, Israeli coalitions right now, um, this really uh, calls for... Uh, fear, of course, we are. Uh, we have to take into consideration that now someone who says death to Arabs is not an extremist, extremist on the street. Now he's part of the governing entity. But also, this in a way is also very good because now it is very obvious to everyone in the world uh, what kind of apartheid uh, mentality the people of Palestine are living and uh, and facing and. Uh, the truth must, uh, in the end, must shine. As we speak right now, uh, there are uh, teens and university students from Tul Karim to Jenin to uh, uh, Beit Lahan to al to actually Jerusalem. They are active everywhere on social media and the streets, and they are not letting this pass. Uh, and whether the uh, the Arab leadership, the uh, the Arab politicians, uh, in uh, the uh, Gulf region, in the Levant region, in Lebanon, Syria, Palestine, Iraq, whether they are really in line with the youth, with the Palestinian youth or not, it's not really going to change. The demographics, the reality, the future is here. And uh, these kids, without the help of anyone in the world, without uh, uh, weapons, without money, without funds, they have been able to raised their voice ever since Sheikh Jarrah and till day. And this for me, as a person in this region, is the hope uh, and is the future. And uh, Netanyahu can rule now, but nobody can defend this apartheid any, any longer. Maybe one year, maybe two years. But in the end, the world cannot remain silent because it's very obvious we're being killed down the streets, sir. La just last month, uh, Nurhan Sayad is a 14-year-old a girl, she was kidnapped and beaten by settlers 
And then later on, uh, uh, the, she was found uh, very brutally beaten just because she's a Palestinian girl living in her own ancestors' land. And uh, even the moderate Jews of the society over there are facing such things. Uh, we cannot really forget now, a few months ago, it was the olive season harvest all across the Mediterranean. And in Palestine, where the olive uh, season is something encrypted in the legacy for thousands and thousands of years, ever since the Palestinian Jesus was born. But just like every year, the farmers are being, um, uh, they're being tackled, they're being terrorized, they're being beaten up and sometimes killed when they're trying to go and harvest their trees. Now, this cannot be always displaced as this is the terrorism while you have uh, Ben Gavir uh, shouting death to Arabs and you're going to sell this as a moderate politician anymore or a democracy or whatever they used to say, it is the leading democracy in the Middle East. It's not. It is a place where 14-year-old girls are being beaten up just because they are of a certain race, ethnicity, religion. Uh, and this, sir, uh, is the ABC of an apartheid and what uh, the world wouldn't uh, tolerate decades ago and what South Africa and other nations all around the world was able to break decades ago will not be tolerated in Palestine where we have thousands and thousands of very enlightened, very strong and very uh, uh, very uh, decided uh, people and they will uh, they will get their rights one way or the other. Well, Mandela's grandson I saw just the other day uh, denouncing what he called apartheid. In fact, he says what the Palestinians are facing is much worse than the apartheid, that the uh, Africans in uh, apartheid South Africa faced. And of course, he was then uh, savaged as an anti-Semite. The same trick they tried uh, with, uh, with Archbishop Desmond Tutu when he said something similar. If I was in the British Labour Party, God forbid, and I described Israel as an apartheid state, I would be expelled from the party for that single comment. Only got time uh, to deal with one more subject, Ghadi, if you'll bear with me. Uh, it seems to me that the uh, scrapping of the Iran nuclear deal by the Joe Biden administration is uh, pregnant with some real uh, formidable possibilities, one of which is that Iran now develops a nuclear weapon. Uh, it says it is theologically opposed to uh, such a weapon, but it now at least has no treaty obligation not to build one, as it previously did with the Iran nuclear deal. It, Israel is raising as much as it can the fear of such a thing, not least in Saudi Arabia. At the same time, Iran is offering an olive branch to Saudi Arabia. The plates are still uh, shifting uh, in the Persian Gulf region. How would you summarize where we are there? Well, sir, here in this region, ever since 1979, uh, it has been an international pariah. The Islamic uh, Republic of Iran has not been a friend of the West or a beloved figure. So when you see that the West or Saudi Arabia or Israel or the United States has a problem with Iran, it is not something new. Now we are speaking about a state that has been under sanctions for more than three decades. They have been an international pariah and uh, demonized for all these uh, decades and all these years. So now if the Americans are angry or the treaty is not going to happen or there's uh, like uh, a fear or a brewing fear uh, of Iran, what more would the West do? Declare war? If, they were po if it was possible and feasible, they would have done it like years ago. And what has been happening in the whole Middle East is a proxy warfare with Iran. Whether it is the... Um, uh, the the maritime warfare sometimes in the Arab Sea in the Arab Gulf uh, there's like oil tanks that are hit here or there uh, indirect uh, uh, goals sometimes there are targets in Syria that the Israelis target and then they say this is an Iranian uh, target 
and uh, sometimes in uh, Iraq as well. So when we say that the West has a problem with, with Iran, this is not new. And when we say that Israel is trying to make a problem or like to to increase or accumulate this or accelerate this with the Saudi Arabians, also this is not uh, true. But now we are speaking about a regime that has been able to prove itself very worthy of making manufacturing weapons, drones, military drones, military rockets, ballistic rockets, and also, as the whole world knows, this nuclear enrichment and uh, the uranium enrichment and so on. Yes, it is a theological no-no for the Islamic uh, leadership of Iran uh, to have a nuclear bomb. But uh, whatever it was bargaining or it was uh, offering the West wasn't something different. They, the Iranians have remained on their terms before, during and after the nuclear uh, talks were like uh, coming to a good term or a bad term. The Iranians have always said the same thing. You uh, release the sanctions and we will talk about other, other things. The West has been uh, the party that has been changing and fluctuating. Sometimes they want to uh, release the sanctions over the IRGC and sometimes they, send, they say, no, you can sell these nations or not. But uh, the fact is Saudi Arabia does not have the ability to fight Iran, does not have the... Uh, uh, the uh, uh, they don't want to fight Iran. They want to see every nation is now looking for its own interest, especially with, with the world changing since the last uh, February, since the whole world stopped and was watching what's happening uh, uh, between Russia and Ukraine. So Saudi Arabia now at the time when the, for the first time maybe since the fun founding of, of Saudi Arabia, it is saying no to the terms of the United States. The OPEC uh, is... Uh, uh, sometimes saying we want to have an oil cut production so on there with the Chinese and with the Russians, they're forming their own policies. At such a time to drive Saudi Arabia to fight Iran, I don't think it's possible when you see that they are actually leading indirect talks in Iraq or the Saudis are coming back to Syria or all these fronts that were basically front lines between Iranians and uh, Saudi Arabians now are uh, uh, places of uh, maybe talk or indirect talk. So I don't think anything would change. I think it's more love, like a noise and uh, yes, they are trying to cause a problem. And of course, they are causing a different uh, narrative about Iran in the region and in the world, whether it's in the media or the tongues and the facts that are being uh, like perturbated around. But also the main strengths of Iran, whether it's the few million people or the several million people that we saw out on the streets when Qasem Soleimani was assassinated these people are iranians as well these people back the iranian islamic regime as is and the islamic regime manufactures weapons drones uh, that has oil production and uh, nuclear power so uh, i don't think it's going to uh, to face any different or uh, let's say harder uh, uh, circumstances in the future it hasn't been an easy way for Iran during the past decades. And uh, in the light of all these sanctions and all this Western policy towards Iran, Iran was able to uh, uh, grow. Uh, the, the Shah Iran, before it was Islamic, the Shah Iran was not able to talk or to uh, uh, articulate its influence in five or six other uh, countries in the Middle East. Today, when you speak about the Islamic uh, regime in Iran, you are speaking about the, uh, about a regime that is, has an alliance with Syria, Iraq, uh, Yemen, Lebanon, Bahrain, parts of uh, uh, maybe Kuwait or Oman. So you are not talking about a regime that is closed in Turkey as well and Kurdistan, the, the Iraqi Kurdistan. So you are speaking about an Iran that is even more powerful than it was uh, before and that doesn't really need... Uh, anything from the West in this region. So I think it's all noise and uh, we have a, a tough uh, few months to come, but uh, another uh, reality must be drawn and diplomacy will come back to solve the issue because there would be no such war with Iran. Nobody can handle such a war with a very strong nuclear Iran. Radi Francis, thanks for joining us on the mother of all talk shows.